welcome to the upskilling through uh, digital platform session. Uh, given that we are relatively tight on time, uh, let's get started. So I'm Annabelle Schiff, uh, moderator for the session and a director at Calvary Digital, which is a global consulting and research firm. Before we get started with our panel discussion, I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction to set the stage on the role digital platforms are playing in creating new opportunities for MSMEs and in doing so new opportunities for partnerships between platforms and service, uh, service providers, including financial service providers. So across emerging markets, uh, digital platforms are continuing to expand their operations. As an example, according to a uh, recent Senfri study from 2019, there are close to 400 digital platforms in operation in Africa, which is a 37% increase from the previous year. As they grow and expand into different market sectors and into different countries, platforms, um, especially what we've seen from our research, marketplace platforms and social media platforms are increasingly creating new opportunities for ind individuals and MSMEs to access work, um, access finance and develop new skills. And I'm just going to speak about quickly these um, three trends. So firstly, looking at um, how digital platforms are creating income uh, generating opportunities. While overall le uh, levels of platform livelihoods remain relatively low in emerging markets, there is um, exciting evidence of growth. And this is because platforms lower the barrier to entry for low income and marginalized groups such as women, enabling them often from the comfort of their own home to access broader markets and enhance their discoverability, improve the efficiency of finding work, etc. Um, and while there are obviously still gender constraints, the platform ecosystem has been described by some as a leveler in terms of helping to bring equality to the entrepreneurial um, entrepreneurial playing field for, for women. And this is evident from the increasing um, number of women we see working across marketplace platforms. Taking our panelists as examples, um, 40% of Jumia sellers are women, 40% of ShopUp's online MSMEs are women, and the Amazon Saheli Initiative, um, which, is which is an Amazon initiative, initiative focused on providing women artisans with ac access to the Indian Amazon marketplace, works with close to 280,000 women artisans across the length and breadth of the country. Moving on quickly to access to finance, there is obviously a natural linkage between markets, marketplace platforms and digital financial services, given that these digital platforms have large growing networks of customers and producers on their platforms, um, as well as standardized um, and digital, obviously digital data on their spending patterns, commercial activity, income streams, et cetera. And this opens up lots of potential partnership opportunities for platforms and financial service providers. The platform's expansion into financial services obviously isn't always easy. Um, often new products need to be developed, existing ones need to be modified, and obviously platform users as well need to be educated about the financial services um, and products on offer, which leads me on to um, the last topic I want to discuss, which is upskilling and the focus of this um, this uh, breakout session. So over the last couple of years, we've been looking at the role that, um, us at Caribou have been looking at the role that uh, digital platforms are playing in the skills development landscape. Through our research, speaking to global and local platforms, uh, what we uncovered is that all platforms are investing in training the um, small scale vendors, the entrepreneurs, the micro and small businesses who earn a living across their platforms, especially in countries where there are significant skills gaps. It's hard, it's expensive, but it's a necessary, necessary part of doing business. What we also found was that platforms aren't just training on um, how to use a platform, what we call platform proficiency, but on a wide range of skills for a digital age. So including, in addition to platform proficiency, uh, financial literacy, so how to effectively and responsibly use the financial products and services on offer, digital literacy, business planning, soft skills, etc. And these skills not only equip them to better perform their platform work, but we also found that the, the transferable nature of this, um, these skills and the training offered also is having an impact on these individuals and these um, businesses off platform um, business and livelihoods as well. So, for example, um, early in the year, Uber, in partnership with a training institute called AMI, uh, based in Kenya, ran a training program for women drivers and, and women micro entrepreneurs in the broader Uber driving um, community uh, in Kenya and South Africa. In South Africa, as a result of the training, on average, participants' monthly income increased by 86% and 50% expanded their um, Uber business or found new business opportunities. 
So although obviously platforms aren't the only story in digitization, they are a major force reworking how individuals and small businesses communicate, find work, advertise their products and services, access financial services, and increasingly develop their skills. Any discussion of um, livelihoods and, and the growth of small businesses in 2020 and beyond really should account for the growing role of platforms. And to continue this discussion, um, I'm very excited to introduce the panelists that we have today on, in this breakout group. So first, let me just introduce uh, Juliet. She's the chairman of Jumia Nigeria and head of institutional affairs at Jumia Group. Prior to her current role at Jumia, she spent four years managing Jumia Nigeria. Launched in 2012, Jumia is the largest e-commerce platform in Africa with presence in 11 countries. It's also the first African tech startup to, to be listed on the NYSE. There are currently over 115,000 Jumia sellers across the continent. Uh, Afif is co-founder and CEO of ShopUp in Bangladesh. Afif founded his first startup, um, technology startup at the age of 20. In 2016, he started ShopUp, Bangladesh's leading full stack B2B platform for MSMEs. More than 655,000 merchants use the platform. ShopUp provides them easy access to digital credit, B2B sourcing, logistics, and business management solutions. And lastly, um, we have Satish, who is the head of marketing at Amazon India. Satish has been instrumental in building Amazon India's brand, being at the helm of award-winning marketing campaigns. In addition to leading marketing, he also has strategic categories, including Amazon Saheli and Amazon Kiraga. Amazon Saheli is an initiative, um, as, I, as I mentioned in the introduction, which is aimed at empowering women artists and entrepreneurs uh, across the country. And so, yeah, let me kick off the conversation and hear more from the panelists on how they are upskilling their users and partnering with financial service providers. So starting uh, with Juliet and Jumia. Um, Juliet, Jumia obviously invests heavily in training um, their vendors from in-classroom events, online courses to your AI-driven uh, upskilling interventions. Could you just walk us quickly through the typical seller's journey when they interact with these different um, training modalities and what skills are required in the process? Thanks, Annabelle. So um, a seller, as soon as he registered on Jumia, gets a, a link that uh, invites him to a training session. It used to be both offline and online, but uh, post-COVID is, is largely a virtual training. And it's a three-hour session, and basically it takes the, the seller through the uh, onboarding process, um, how to list the products on the platform, uh, basic information on assortment, pricing, and everything that is related to, to being able to sell on a platform. So, and they are, at the end of the training, they get a training materials that is sent to them and a link to test them to make sure that they actually pass that test. If they have a cutoff mark of about 75%, then they go on to have their products live. The day after that training, we still have a routine call to the seller where we take, just make sure that they understood the training. We go through the basics again. So this is a one-on-one -on -one session now. I'd like to also mention that, uh, that all this training happens in a free conference call app. So it's at no cost to the seller, just to make sure that they don't bear any cost for that training. Uh, day eight, after the sign up, we, we follow up again. We have uh, several sessions with them just to make sure if they're live on the platform, if they're not live uh, yet, what are the challenges they have in terms of listing their products? If they're live and they haven't sold, then we go through the process about pricing, content creation, uh, rating, how the ratings are very important in terms of how they're able to sell on the platform. Um, day 15, day 30, we also have a lot of sessions. So we basically walk the, the seller through uh, from a registration until we're fairly comfortable that uh, she's able to, uh, to operate quite well and sell their products. And like you mentioned, the, the uh, training that they receive is applicable to many aspects of what they do, even in their offline uh, business. There's an ICC report that shows, uh, shows that sellers who su are successful online, trading online, are actually five times more likely to export than if they were not selling online. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Um, so my second question was more on your uh, partnership with financial service providers. So in, in addition to your Jumia Pay payment solution, in select markets, Jumia also offers capital to sellers. Could you just explain a bit about the role that um, Jumia is playing in terms of enabling MSMEs to access finance and therefore um, the role that you're playing in contributing to the financial inclusion landscape in Africa? 
Yeah, thanks. So we, we consider e-commerce as an integral part of the financial inclusion play in Africa because financial inclusion is very much tied to economic activity for, for, uh, for MSME you know, on the continent. And so it's a value chain. So the value chain starts with the, uh, you know, bringing them online, helping them to sell, uh, linking them to all the capabilities that we have on, on, on trading on our platform, and then extension to lending. So we've got Jumia Lending. Jumia Lending is live in about six countries where we operate uh, out of 11. We have it in Nigeria, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Morocco, uh, I think Kenya, and uh, and uh, I think what, one other country, I can't remember, but all six, six countries in, in Africa. And average uh, working capital loan is about 2,000 euros on average for, for a seller. And our role really is, is, uh, is lead generation. So because of the, of course, we have transaction history for the seller, which acts as a proxy for credit uh, rating from a, a lender perspective. And so the lenders value that, that transaction history as a, and use it as, as a proxy for, for credit rating. And on the back of that, be able to select a sellers who they can then lend to. And we, like I said, we, we play a lead generation role. Uh, we have several partners. We have Baobab, which is a microfinance entity operating in Africa as one of our partners to provide lending to our sellers. Hello? Sorry, continue to do that. I'm not sure what that was. Yeah, we have Lendigo, we have uh, Cast Money, we and have Lendigo. Yes, like that, who, uh, who provide lending to, to sellers on our Prestamos a los vendedores. Hi, sorry. Could could everyone just please mute if you're not, if you're not speaking? Thank you. Sorry, Juliet. Thank you. <laughs> Gracias. Great. Okay. So Afif, moving um, on to um, some questions uh, for you and about shop up. Um, Many of your, uh, as, as I mentioned in the introduction, many of the, your shop up entrepreneurs are women. How have you designed and adapted your, your training to ensure relevance and reach amongst um, these women entrepreneurs? Sure, uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for, for having me here. It's really excited to be part of this panel. Uh, so from the very early days of shop up, what we realized is there are a lot of nuances in running businesses for these small entrepreneurs, right? So from a training point of view, what we found more value in is instead of us uh, giving them uh, direct information about uh, their business, if we can create an environment where they can learn from each other, uh, we realized that that basically brought more value for these entrepreneurs. Uh, it's basically community-based learning. So what we used to do is we, we used to uh, arrange these physical events where we will get a, a group of entrepreneurs who are facing the same problems. We'll also get a specialist and they will basically speak with each other. They will uh, share insights and learn from each other. Uh, so that actually uh, had, uh, uh, that actually was quite uh, popular amongst the merchant group that we had. But after COVID, uh, we, we cannot arrange these physical meetings anymore. So what we tried to do is we took that same principle and replicate that model online. So we'll now have these small Facebook groups where we'll have these entrepreneurs and we'll have our community engagement person and also a specialist and they will basically do the same same uh, uh, same method of engagement as well. Uh, we also hold these live events where we also invite all these entrepreneurs and we typically talk about one particular topic at each live event. Uh, now the interesting thing that we found out is that before, a good chunk of our entrepreneurs are actually uh, housewives and students. So mobility has been an issue for them. So during our physical training events, they could not always attend those. But now since all of these are actually online and virtual, so all of them can actually participate more and getting more and more value out of that. So going forward, we are actually looking forward to leverage more of these online channels instead of doing, doing uh, offline physical events. Great, thank you. Um, and then another question for you, again, um, moving on to kind of your um, partnerships that you have with financial institutions. Um, you've partnered with a number of financial in institutions to provide this affordable uh, credit to your sellers. Can you share a bit about um, the win-win-win here for your business, um, the financial service providers, and then obviously ultimately your sellers as well? Yeah. Uh, so almost all of our, all, all of the entrepreneurs that we work with, like 96% of them, 
don't have access to any formal financing uh, institutions, right? So they are completely invisible to these uh, banks and F FIs. And the reason for that is the transaction cost of lending to these small entrepreneurs is so high that it does not make any economic sense for the bank structure to lend to them. And it becomes a very big bottleneck for, for all these entrepreneurs, right? So we, we thought a lot about this problem. And uh, one key learning that we have had is like the hybrid models don't work here, right? So uh, if we want to solve this problem, we, we need to digitize the entire credit book. So which basically means the following steps, all of them needs to be digitized. So, so it starts from merchant onboarding, um, which includes KYC as well, uh, the assessment of the merchant, disbursement of the loan, and also collection of the, of the loan as well. So all of these steps needs to be digitized. Otherwise, if the bank still needs to deploy their resources for one of these steps, like the transaction cost still goes up, right? So if you just uh, do the first three steps and the remaining step is done by the lending partner, and uh, the partnership doesn't really work out like that. That's from our experience. So that's why we are actually big, uh, big uh, uh, fans of entirely embedded financing products because that digitizes the entire loop and brings value to everyone in the ecosystem. Great, thank you very much. Um, and lastly, uh, Satish, um, again, a couple of questions, one on upskilling and the second on um, your partnership um, with financial service providers. Um, so, yeah, obviously, Amazon Saheli, the idea is that it empowers um, Indian women entrepreneurs to sell their products across the Amazon platform. Um, given that you're working with um, artisans, what are the major skills and capacity gaps that you've encountered amongst these women? Um, and what training initiatives are you offer offering in response? Thanks, uh, Annabelle, for the question. Um, to begin with, I think when we started this way back in 2017, um, we started with very basic skill gaps, like people, uh, women entrepreneurs were coming or marginalized uh, cohort of the society in some form. Uh, we started looking at that. We realized that a lot of them didn't even understand what e-commerce is to begin with. And at that point of time, our challenges and our uh, uh, challenges were very different. We had to first train them on saying what e-commerce is, why do you need to focus in the entire supply chain from where a product is created to how it reaches a customer. Between that, there are multiple steps and how they need to focus on what their skill sets are and need to forget everything which is upstream and downstream and that's where Amazon comes in. So we have to go very basic to that level to begin with. As we have progressed over the years, we have seen some of those challenges shifting uh, a little bit of base and coming to pieces like uh, what is it that customers want and what do they need to make? Like there's a skill set, like you'll find a lot of women entrepreneurs focused on saying creating art and craft forms, which they have been doing forever. But if there is a cust whether there is a customer demand around it or not, like uh, that understanding in the first place, that is a huge gap, which we are trying to build by providing insights to these women entrepreneurs and saying what really sells out of the selection that you had, which is let's say 50 different products, 20 of them are really selling well, but the 30 you need to like change how you think about it. It doesn't have the right demand or you need to put invest. Uh, so that's one uh, gap. The second is how do you optimize for your business supply chain overall? Like a lot of these products because sometimes they're handmade, sometimes uh, not so much, but uh, what quantities like the entire inventory management, that is some another thing which we are really focusing on on um, letting these entrepreneurs know how to really deal with it because if it goes out of stock most of the e-commerce marketplaces have algorithms which uh, show uh, products to customers which are in stock which keep coming back uh, which people are buying again and again so the algorithms work like that and therefore people need to entrepreneurs need to understand that and keep things in stock so uh, if something goes out of stock and that is only one unit in uh, stock that is a challenge so these are the more recent things that we are trying to uh, build the skills around uh, helping them understand through insights and uh, the ways in which we are solving for these. Uh, uh, although uh, Julia and Afif talked about a few of them, but we are focusing on basically three, four different pillars. One is firstly um, on making everything self-serve as much as we can. Like we're putting a lot of repository for people to know. Um, in India, language changes every 50 kilometers, if I make say so, uh, and it's a huge country. 
but what we have been focusing on is to trying to get information in as many languages as possible so it becomes easy for uh, um, these entrepreneurs to uh, really get to the crux of it so a lot of it is self-serve we are trying to lot, build a lot of tools which these uh, entrepreneurs can use in a self-serve manner and then there are lots of programs which are slightly high touch uh, talks about community learning talks about how we create something called set still a university through which we offer offline and online classrooms uh, there's a lot there's a program called amazon sathi which is about community learning one uh, successful not one but many successful sellers telling others what they learned from their own journey um, and then in the end there's a lot of stuff which leadership connects with entrepreneurs every uh, couple of months to uh, kind of talk about what's new what do they need to focus on and uh, so on and so forth so those are the ways in which we are trying to reach out um, and help uh, in the entire scaling aspect of it great and then um just a question for you also on um your partnership with financial service providers um amazon india offers um a marketplace for sellers to obtain competitive loans from um, a number of different financial institutions can you tell us a bit about how this marketplace works and the impact that this has had on the growth of these amazon saheli entrepreneurs um Maybe I wouldn't uh, pivot this one only on Amazon Saheli will just make it a little widespread. Yeah. But Amazon lending as a program is deep seeded into the seller central, uh, the portal which sellers use uh, in any way. Um, it is an invite only program, by the way, uh, because of the aspect that we've talked about on, on loans, like a lot of them are not eligible for loans elsewhere. And what really works is the credit. And I think Julie also mentioned the credit history uh, in the absence of that in the external world, what works is uh, the business history that they have on Amazon. So uh, depending on the backend uh, algorithms, again, the system throws up on the um, for the seller, this notice on saying you're eligible for a loan. Uh, and these loan amounts start as low as, um, let's say, $200 to begin with. Um, uh, those are micro loans, people. There are certain uh, entrepreneurs who just might need like as much capital just to buy certain stock and stuff and keep it. And we are trying to make that possible as well because the biggest problem lies uh, for this cohort where micro loans is a bigger problem. And, and the, the amount could go up to really high to three thousand, four thousand, five thousand dollars, uh, as uh, you would, um, uh, or fifty thousand dollars, not four thousand, five thousand. Mm -hmm. So that that amount can go up to that as well. Uh, it is deep integrated into the seller central system. How it works is people get an invite. Uh, you can opt for it, and then through the number of partnerships through both banks and NBFCs that we have. Uh, the partner could choose or the entrepreneur could choose from that uh, in terms of the offering that suits them best. Um, the disbursement and everything is like really automated. It just happens uh, once you have applied for it. It is through the seller central. There's no second tool that you'll have to use. Everything is there. And in terms of uh, return of loans and stuff, it just gets uh, kind of adjusted in the business that happens depending on what the entrepreneur would really really want to so that's how we've been working on it um it, it's something that uh, we are trying to grow every day and like i said earlier the focus is on saying how much of micro loans can we offer because uh, all banks are happy to offer like these huge sum of money but there are only as many sellers or entrepreneurs who then um, take that amount of loan the bigger section there's a long tail which will be interested in micro loans and that's where the NBFCs uh, come in in a bigger way. And yeah, we've been trying to bring it together for all of them. Great, thanks so much. Um, given that we only have about five minutes left, I just have a quick final question for all the panelists. So um, as, as you've all shared, and as I spoke about in my introduction, um, digital platforms are increasingly providing opportunities for MSMEs and um, individuals. What, uh, Julia, I'll ask you first, what role do you see digital marketplace platforms playing in terms of improving um, livelihoods amongst um, low income groups and micro and small enterprises um, in the future? Let's meet. <laughs> Thanks, Annabelle. So I think starting, 
the way we see it is is you have to look at the entire ecosystem around the msme okay and if you look at the msme today and you ask yourself what are some of the capabilities that they lack uh, one is clearly we talked about financial access to finance there's also access to certain capabilities and then of course access to market so we we so an e-commerce platform we are providing access to market through the jumia lending uh, and through the different lending platforms, we're also providing access to, uh, to, uh, to finance. The access to capabilities is a huge one. And this is around the fact that MSMEs need other things like how to manage their business, how to manage their inventory, Satish mentioned that that's a big one for them, um, how to manage uh, even staffing. Um, some of them usually start with just one person with one laptop who's managing their seller center account on Jumia, for example. Uh, to, so all of those things are small, uh, little uh, capabilities which they require to then be efficiently and effectively managing and running their business and creating wealth. So it's a full scale ecosystem. I think the next phase, like I said, is the, is the full suite of capabilities that they need. And it starts with business management. Uh, like I mentioned, accounting, inventory management, all those basic things down to even human capital management and, and a host of other things, community management, all of that is part of that whole ecosystem. So that's because we're right in the center of it. Uh, and also we are in a position to then interact with multiple partners, be they financial service providers or other kinds of providers. We are in a sweet spot where we can actually drive a lot of impact. Even insurance is part of it as well. Great. Um, Afif, would we get to hear your thoughts on this? Thanks, Juliet. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, thanks a lot. So essentially, if you look at Bangladesh, like it's one of the fastest growing economies, like it's growing at seven to eight percent, but the formal job sector is growing at less than one percent, right? Which basically means there's a big gap of of people. So there, there are a lot of people coming out of poverty, but there's not simply enough jobs, right? So that's why these people have to start their own business. And it's common throughout all the countries in the region. Like if you look at India, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, so like all these countries are actually SME first because of this core reason. Now, if you look at the, the offline entrepreneurs, like the entrepreneurs who have been starting their business the last few decades or so that life is very difficult right so their suppliers cheat them they don't have access to large scale logistics players and the banks won't lend to them right so there are a lot of problems outside their circle of influence now thanks to the access of uh, thanks to uh, their access to internet and technology platforms right now like all these problems that are outside their circle of influence can actually be solved uh, and you can look at other countries like these access to these large scale uh, technology platforms like amazon alibaba Facebook, Shopify, like using these small businesses could actually leapfrog a lot of these problems. So we believe all these new emerging countries will actually significantly uh, uh, benefit from these new technology platforms. So looking forward to the next decade uh, to see how this that goes forward. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Satish, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, just adding to everything that has been said, uh, very simply put, any business needs just two things. One is a great product, and then there are millions of customers that you need to buy that product. Uh, I, I think with marketplaces like Amazon, the part that a lot of businesses don't need to worry about is the second part. So you can focus on making great products, knowing what is it that you want to sell, uh, will it sell uh, too well or not. Uh, beyond that, like I said, probably in my earlier answer as well, there are a lot of upstream downstream things which you may just as an entrepreneur want to not worry too much about there's so much of marketing uh, that goes about building businesses mm -hmm. uh, if you are really one of those uh, small businesses who are starting out setting out to build a huge brand um, and without getting into a omni-channel oblique uh, e-commerce marketplace and stuff it is very difficult these days to like compete in the environment that is there and mm -hmm. we are we are pleasantly surprised with the number of brands that kind of start have started creating a mark in the global landscape, uh, starting out of nowhere, but just like with a small brand uh, on the e-commerce platform. So I think that's the role that uh, these marketplaces play. Um, mm -hmm. There are millions and millions of people who are interesting in, in making it big. Uh, I think this is that uh, level playing uh, playground, which allows them to uh like like show what they have to the world and and that's that's the biggest piece apart from yeah. that 
everything else probably is, is a common denominator for everyone. Great. Thank, thank you so much, um, Satish, Afif, Juliet. I think we've hit time, but um, yeah, great to hear about um, all of the exciting work your platforms are doing. And I think um, Juliet summed up nicely when she said that platforms are at the sweet spot in terms of providing impact. So excited to see what the future holds. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.